Hello and welcome to The Dirt, in association with Envy. We're the podcast that really digs all kinds of plots and growing methods. I'm Laura, editor of Grow Your Own magazine. And I'm Laura's co-host, Blake. Stay tuned for all your usual gardening gossip and jobs on the plot for this week. But first, we're joined by garden writer and allotment holder, Rekka Mystery. Welcome to The Dirt, Rekka. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Um, how um, how are things on your allotment today? Enjoying the sunshine? Enjoying the sunshine, but it's quite, quite muggy today. I, I don't know if it's because of the eclipse that's going to happen. I'm not sure, but it really feels a different different weather today for some yeah. totally different bizarre reason. But it's nice. It's been hot. It's been needed this heat has been needed and it's and I'm enjoying it. It's nice and I, I just find it sometimes a bit difficult to work until the evening. I don't know whether you're like that as well. I quite like going out once it's cooled down a little bit when it's really hot and and spending a couple of hours out there pottering about um later. I think when you're a gardener as a as a profession you don't have that choice you just get used to it (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) you just get used to it I think it's it's really the midday heat that you really have to be quite conscious about yeah but otherwise just just dress dress well hydrate well and I think they work in any weather really yeah um so diving straight in we would like to ask you if you could tell us about some of your biggest gardening successes. Okay. Um, my, my most, the one I'm very proud of is having the allotment itself. Mm-hmm. I think the, you, you, you get overwhelmed when you first get it thinking, what am I going to grow in this piece of land? Mm-hmm. I, gr- I used to grow at home and then I thought I need I need bigger place to grow on. And when you do get an allotment, you think, how am I going to fill this plot? Yeah. But I think over the years, I've managed to do that. And at that success is what I'm most proud of, to have held on to a plot and not given up. That, that I would say, is my most successful feeling it, in general, that I can actually grow something. I can think of something and I'll grow it. And I know it will grow because I've worked that land. I know what I can achieve out of this plot that I've taken on so I would say that is my most uh, ambitious success (laughs) so to speak Uh, the other thing is trying to grow something I've eaten purely in a restaurant never heard of it as as a vegetable Mm. and thinking what is that what is that item because you'll see it in a restaurant menu and they've written by here here you go here's your chicken with say fennel kohlrabi or something yeah. something something and at that time I didn't know what kohlrabi was this is going back a good five to six years mm-hmm. I thought what is kohlrabi I've never heard of this vegetable and then you look it up and you think okay looks looks interesting I think I need to try and grow it because I've eaten it I know what it tastes like let me try and grow it then I can put my own twist towards a recipe it doesn't have to be the exact thing that I ate but it's something that I had tried before. That's a really interesting way of um, of going about things because I'm I tend to be the other way around. I'll see an interesting seed packet mm-hmm. at the garden center, and I think, oh, I've never heard of that. How, what do I do with that? Mm. You know, and then I'll grow it, realize that I don't actually like that <laughs> vegetable <laughs> after all. But never mind. At least, I but grew it's it, yeah. but that that's the whole that's a whole challenge of gardening. Yeah. You know, you you want to try, and you have to try. You, you can't just be set in your way saying this is all I'm going to grow these are the five six vegetables I will grow and that's it Mm. I think sometimes we need to cross that boundary and see we might like it I mean when I took my plot on we never ate rhubarb we'd never because I've eaten it in from uh in a soup from a supermarket a, a made dish but we've never liked it but once I grew my own I put my own twist to the rhubarb and we all love rhubarb and rhubarb cake has become so popular, not just in my family. I think a lot of the um, social media mm. followers I have have made this cake and they, they're in awe about it. So I don't know what it is, but it's it's lovely. I think when you do grow your own, the taste mm. changes for you and you get mm-hmm. to like a vegetable mm, or a definitely. fruit. Yeah, I, agree. I think um, with the things like kohlrabi as well, the nice thing about them is they can be a real talking point 
yeah. as well, can't yes. they? And sort of spreading the yeah. spreading the love of gardening through people sort of coming along and saying, what's this alien thing on your plot? <laughs> That's exactly it. it. It starts with, what is that? And then, then what can you cook with it? And you can eat that, that kohlrabi is something you can eat raw as well as cooked. So it's brilliant. So it's not like you have to wait for it to be cooked. You can mm. pick it and use it raw. As well as the leaves, the leaves are edible too that you can use in stir fry. So the whole vegetable is usable. Mm. Um, and so have you had any things that haven't gone to plan on the plot? Things that, you know, either crops that just haven't worked for you or any kind of funny stories that have happened? Yes, uh, cauliflower. I love cauliflower. Mm. And can I grow it to save my life? No. Oh, no. <laughs> I, no, I have tried and I have tried and I have tried. But I'm not going to give up because this year I really want my own cauliflower to say, yay, I grew <laughs> a nice big florets of cauliflower. I've tried everything from adding in compost in the growing area. I've tried netting it. I don't know what it is, but I will I will get there. That's one of them. Mm. Uh, the other one is fennel. Mm-hmm. Fennel as in the bulb. Yeah. And that's one thing. Again, I think it needs a lot of water, a lot of love. Sometimes I tend to throw my vegetables in saying, you need to grow the way I tell you to grow. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the other way around. <laughs> They're telling me. It's got to be some compromise there, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I need to give in and help them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> rather than the other way around. <laughs> But fennel's, fennel is one. I think a lot of gardeners would say it's a hard one to grow. I think in a small small container, small um, beds, you can grow it. But in an allotment, I am still struggling. So that that's 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 a failure for quite a number of years. But I'm not giving up. I've got the seeds, and I'm going to go for it again yeah. mm. in July. One year, it's going to work. It will work. <laughs> not one year. It will work. <laughs> it's not. I, I don't. I don't do. Um, you know, dismays. Yeah. And, you know, I, I won't go down quietly. <laughs> I will get it. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think as well. You know, it's um, it's always nice to have a challenge, isn't it? Particularly when you've got used to growing your your sort of yearly staples there's yes. you know to always be learned the thing that we always say on here is you're always learning and there's always next year and that's I think one of the really lovely things about gardening is you know you always get another crack at it yes that's right and and never never be disheartened someone will always help you out somewhere and mm. that's mm. where social media I think is a really good tool you can put a question out there and somebody somewhere would be able to help you it may not be the answer, but it might be a start to how you can do on yours because something works for someone else. It may not work for you, mm. but the ideas all come together and it might help a third person who is reading those comments and thinking, oh, I didn't realize I could do that. So let me do that. And that's that's the joy. There will be an answer to some some failures. There will be. There has to be. Um, do you also find that... Um with the fact that you grow on an allotment, there must be obviously everybody having their own ways of doing things. So it's it's another good space for sharing methods and sharing ideas and the fact that I know some people are quite wedded to the way that they do things, but there's always something new to learn or a new technique or a new trick, isn't oh, there? Oh yes, there is. There are there are some plot holders our established plot holders we call them we don't call them old but <laughs> Very different they're established <laughs> yes yes they're established um and they they have their set ways and you you, you learn from them as to why is it set that mm. way why do you not want to try something that i'm doing why is it so but i'm learning why they do it is because i think it's like a, a football manager he won't change a certain mm. shirt style mm because it might be taboo, <laughs> they'll lose the game, yeah. so he might lose his crop or something. Yeah. But it's so nice to learn someone else's way. And being on an allotment, the community, we're from all over the world. There's so many different different um, people around that you can think, I've never heard of that crop. How do you grow it? How do you eat it? Mm. You know, What do you do with it? And that's, that's the joy of being on an allotment. It's a community. There is such a big community spirit. Yeah. And if you're having a bit of trouble trying to understand something, 
there'll, there'll be people who come and actually help you even dig your plot and help you clear it. It's it's amazing how how we can come together. Mm, yeah. And last year showed us that yeah. in abundance. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned there the sort of the almost superstitions around some of the some of the experienced gardeners who mm-hmm. are doing do things the same way every year. We've actually um, talked about that in Grow Your Own before with chitting potatoes, the sort of fact that you don't necessarily need to, but a lot of people do because it signifies a point in the season and things. So do you have any sort of little growing superstitions and habits and things that that you do on your own plot? No, superstitions, no. I, I tend to let I tend to let nature dictate what it wants to do. Mm-hmm. If it's not going to grow for me that year, it is not for me for that year. I am yeah. not going to say, oh, you know, maybe because I did this and maybe because I did that. There is nothing different I have done in all the years. It's probably not it, that that piece of land because I rotate my crops. Yeah. So maybe that rotation, something ended up in my soil. So just let it be. But by the time it comes back in that fourth year, it'll have disappeared by then. So I don't, I don't let super. Uh, no, there is none of that. But I let play in my mind because that, that is the worst thing that can happen is when you really do hold a superstition to why it won't grow for you. I think that's such a good way to do it because it's such a stress-free attitude to have towards it, rather than you know being really, really concerned about why yes. it hasn't happened. Just being able to say no, this year it wasn't for me. It must kind of take a certain level of stress out of that for yeah. you. I think it, it you you sort of do get saddened that it didn't I didn't get potatoes not last year, year before in where I grew. I we didn't get potatoes. Why? I've no idea. My neighbor got them. Everyone else had potatoes. I am the only one who didn't have potatoes. And couldn't figure out why. And I still to this day I can't figure out why. Why that piece of land didn't give me potatoes. But you have to let nature take the, the, the direction it wants to, you to go in. Mm-hmm. You can't always dictate nature. Nature always wins. For, you know, no matter what we try and say something, nature will win. And it will find a way of producing for you somehow, somewhere. Yeah. And it could be just that where I got the potatoes from, maybe they were the bad source, not the soil was the bad source. So we always have to think it's not always the soil at fault. It might be the seed that we bought at fault mm. and just change the supplier completely go go completely different and that that's that's the way i look at it the other way is help your plants and that's something what we call the um companion planting mm. what, why that is the way to help our plants get the most for us make the most for us and by growing lots of flowers within within your kitchen garden, draws the bees, the, the hoverflies, the, the ladybirds, it brings them all there. And so if you do have a pest, you don't need to touch a chemical. They will do the work for you. And when they say you need chemicals of some sort, that's not true because if you do kill all your pests, then there's no way for the ladybirds or the bees or uh, the hoverflies mm-hmm. to come and mm-hmm. feed on. So you do need a certain number of pests. Even though we don't like them, we have to have them because that's the cycle we need to remember. Yeah. That's the only way it will work. Um, in terms of companion planting, do you have any uh, combinations that you think really work or that you would recommend for people that are listening at home now? There is one that I think we should always have. Everyone should grow this, regardless whether you have a kitchen garden or just an ornamental garden, is borage. Mm. For me, borage is the the key to every corner of my allotment. Mm -hmm. I have it, I I let it self-seed wherever it wishes to. I'll take most of the seedlings off and just keep the ones I want. But borage brings in so many bees. It it is amazing to see just standing near a plant the, the amount of activity that goes on within around that plant. Yeah. And those bees will go to the plants that you want them to. It's if it's, it's the most natural thing bees do. And borage is one. Comfrey is another one. Mm-hmm. So if you have some space in your garden, grow comfrey. But if you haven't, 
grow borage. I think that's that's one plant everybody mm. should have. Um, so moving on to tips and tricks, do you have any sort of speedy hacks or money-saving tips or anything that you'd be able to share with the listeners? The one I give is make your own feed. Make your own plant feed. Mm-hmm. Even weeds can make you feed. Because the deep-rooted weeds are very similar to our comfrey, which is a deep-rooted plant. And if you just take the top of the, of the most deep-rooted prickly weed, steep it in water, that is, ni- there, that is nitrogen right there mm-hmm. for you to feed your young seedlings in the garden. That, so, so don't think weeds are bad. Weeds are good. Mm-hmm. They, they can help you as well. Uh, the other one I would say is... Try and grow lots of flowers. Doesn't matter which ones. Try, just just start with something you like. Even cut flowers. Just grow as much as you can. Create an environment for the eco environment that we call for bees to come into. Mm-hmm. The other one is reuse your spent compost. A lot of people would be growing in pots. You can reuse that compost. You don't need to get rid of it. You can use it a second year by adding. Um, seaweed to it and that will help um, boost the roots again of the next crop yeah don't try and grow the same uh, plants in the same in that same pot so when I say same so don't grow beans in the same place where you grew beans before but grow something else so try and reuse whatever you've used and mm-hmm. get get a couple of more years out of that compost yeah uh, the other one I would say is maybe comfrey. If you are growing comfrey, add the leaves to the base of your plants. That way you're adding, it's a slow release. So when they do rot down, they can take up the nutrients without you having to make the most stinkiest feed that comfrey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that does put some people off, doesn't it? Making yes, it does. Own. So just, just, te- just cut the leaves, chop them up a little bit if you need to. Bury them down and then plant whatever you want to plant. So your tomatoes, that is how that is the only way I do my planting. It takes me a while because you have to cut the leaves, dig a deeper hole, place the leaves, put a bit more soil back on and then plant the tomato. But in the end, it's such a really good way to boost the plant without having to do anything. So if you haven't got time to feed, you know there's something below that will help it boost up. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really, I think that's a really great tip because um, as we know, there were lots of people that took up gardening for the first time last year and maybe don't have quite as much time for it now. And also, I think when you're new to gardening, how to feed and what to feed can be quite a confusing, quite a confusing topic. So I think knowing that there's something that you can do at the start that will help your plants throughout their life cycle is so useful yes but that, that's one thing i say when you when you start in the spring you've got all the weeds that you might have weeds you might have the perennial weeds so try and use those and to your benefit because by just making a feed and just pouring that water or the, the feed mixture all over the soil that will also help the seedlings because it's still that that nitrogen is sitting in your soil so the minute you put your seeds down and they germinate, they will be taking up that nitrogen. So it doesn't you don't have to always be full of that smell. Mm. You can you can just pour it out and start again. And what one final tip from me would be greenhouses. A lot of people would love to have a greenhouse but have no idea about how to control the heat in there. It's nice to have a greenhouse and yes, greenhouse need to be hot, but they shouldn't be dry. Mm-hmm. That, that is one thing I found when I first took it on, thinking, yay, I've got a greenhouse. Brilliant. And then that was it. I put the plants in and thought that's all they need is heat. And did I get spider mite? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> did I get spider mite? <laughs> they were on everything. It was covered, covered, and I couldn't figure out why. And that's a learning curve. But you need to raise humidity. And the only way you can do it is by adding water onto your onto the floor just yeah. or spray water to the plant raise that humidity because pests hate uh claggy air they like dry air so just try just put water all i do twice a day in this heat morning and evening is 
pour water on my floor and leave a bucket of water and that will raise humidity because it's there mm -hmm. and that warm water is so good to pour onto your plants because they like warm roots mm -hmm. and they will really spruce up again yeah and that is one thing that I learned and I think a lot of people forget that greenhouses are not just meant to be hot they're meant to be humid as well so raise humidity so finally before we let you get back to your allotment what would you say has been the biggest lesson that you've learned since you've been growing your own fruit and veg patience I've learned to be patient with my plants <laughs> because <laughs> yes you you see you see a lot of Sometimes, sometimes you see a lot of people saying, oh, I've grown this and this is how I did it. But the length of time is never mentioned how long it takes for that item to be seen. Mm. You might have the seed and you say, oh, I know this person grew it, so I need to grow it. Why is it taking so long? But that's just the way the plants are. Some, some will produce as quick as anything. Some will take time. But patience is the one thing I've learned. Be patient. Let your let your garden tell you how it wants to grow sometimes. D don't try and push it. Instant is not always the way. Patience. Patiently letting you learn the land is so much far better than just trying to create something quite quickly mm. and then being bogged down with why isn't it working. Yeah. And that is the one thing I would say is, is just just... Be aware of the nature. It tells you, plants talk back to you. <laughs> That's what mm. I say. They do talk to you. You look at them and you think, why don't you want to do this? And why are you doing this? And just by watching weekly or daily what's happening to a plant will tell you what it needs, what it doesn't need. So there, there, are, there are those little things that I've learned along the way so when I say I talk to my clients I actually really do talk to them I I ask them and I say hello and I say goodbye and I'll say I'll see you tomorrow <laughs> you know I do do those things but, but that's just me <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get to know them oh yeah. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah they need to know who their owner is <laughs> yeah. I think um, I do think the patient side of things is really important because obviously we live in quite a fast paced society now where yes um everything has to happen quickly everything has to yeah. be immediate you know we yeah I mean <laughs> don't get me wrong I love to binge a box set of something but even with tv shows you don't wait a week to watch an episode anymore it all, no you know no. everything is instant so the fact that I think you can step into the garden and things really do slow down don't they and give you yeah. and it you helps a good life down. skill yes yeah. it helps you meditate in some way you're actually meditating because you you're doing it at the pace that is yeah. natural mm -hmm. it's not it's not unnatural i think when you do see things growing at a at a really speedy rate that is unnatural but gardening is the most calm you know meditative yoga whatever you want to call it that that is that is it yeah and you can come away an hour later. You might not have done much, but it has calmed you so much that you won't even realize you've done that. Mm. And it's just done it naturally. You, ha you, you, have, you haven't had to pay a penny for that. You've just stepped out in your garden yeah. on your allotment and come back. And that's it. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us um, today, Rekha. And we will let you get back to it. Oh, lovely. Um, thank you. No, thank you for having me. <laughs> And enjoy the sun. <laughs> yeah, enjoy it. And Blake, shall we go and speak to Dave from Envy? Hello, Dave. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, pleased to be here. And how are you doing? How are things in your garden this morning? Uh, everything's rosy. Everything's growing really well and uh, the sun's shining, so it's all good. Oh, yes. I think the plants are all loving the sunshine, aren't they, after... A long time of rain. Yeah, they seem to have sprung into life. Um, so you've kindly joined us today to um, answer some questions that have been sent in by readers. Yeah. And you are a horticultural technician at MV and Bio8, um, who are kindly sponsoring this this series of the podcast. So we're going to dive straight in with some of these questions, if that's okay. That's, that's fine. The first question is from Catherine Davis 13 on Instagram 
And she asks, can I reuse all the compost from my pots this year for next year? Or will all the nutrients be gone? Um, That's a great question, really, because obviously with the peat um, issues that we have, the more we can reuse, the better. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd certainly reuse any compost um, for a second year at least. Um, uh, So what I would do is use it as a mulch uh, Mm -hmm. on a garden. Uh, but ov- obviously, just check that there's no bugs or pests in there, like vine weevils. They're, they're easy. To, they're easy to spot. Mm-hmm. Um, they tend to be a little creamy coloured grub with a with a ho- orange head um, that curl up as you uh, get near them. Um, so just remove those. You can put them on a bird table or something like that. The birds will fetch them. Um, but yeah, I'd certainly use it for a mulch. Um, or you can reinvigorate it the following year. If you bag it up and store it somewhere, but always let it dry out before you, you bag it up, store it for the next year, and then you can use a, a product called um, Compost Probiotic, mm-hmm. um, which, which is an Envy product. Um, the instructions are dead easy to, to follow, and it just reinvigorates your compost. Um, we're trialing it at the minute, um, growing beans in there. Um, and it's sort of been a mixed success the plants are growing well but they're not the same they haven't got the same vibrant green color Mm -hmm. as the as the plants that are grown in new compost but i would certainly uh, have a go at that and and reuse it because it's like i say it's saving the environment it's saving yourself money as well Mm -hmm. definitely i think that's really become something that's at the forefront of everybody's mind a lot more now isn't it the sort of not going straight to buying new and as you say, definitely not buying peat-based yeah. composts and things like that. Yeah, try and avoid the peat at all costs because um, it's such such a, a damaging product to the environment. I know it's a great medium to grow in, but we've, we've got to find a, a, an alternative. Mm. And obviously re- reusing any compost that we've got it's fantastic. Mm. And having a having a product that can give the compost that little boost again is, is so useful because then it you know hopefully will mean that more people will be able to Mm. reuse their compost and see good levels of success yeah and it's it's really easy to use it's just it's just a powder that you you put into a water and you you add it to your bag of compost and you store it in your greenhouse for a couple of days to to warm it up warm it through get it active and um, yeah it's showing signs of being quite effective Mm -hmm. um so the second question comes from jennifer and who is a new gardener and um probably a lot of people are feeling similar if they're new to gardening so she says she feels a bit confused about when to feed different crops and what to feed them um so can you offer any help on that yeah it it can be quite a confusing issue when when to feed plants i certainly wouldn't feed any plant until it's got true leaves on it Uh um all the seedlings tend to come through and look more or less the same They they have two small leaves on the true leaves are sort of uh, specific to the plant itself so you'll see the difference Um, and I certainly wouldn't feed any plant until it gets to at least two or three of its true leaves. Mm -hmm. Um, At at the early stage again the compost or the medium that you're growing in should have a a few weeks life in it Um, you know it should have nutrients for for three or four weeks so you shouldn't need to feed it for the first three or four weeks anyway Um, but after that um, you're looking to use a feed that's high in nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen helps the leaf development and phosphorus helps root growth. So the, if you look for a, um, the details on any feed or uh, anything that you're going to use on the, the, the plants, look for something that's sort of nitrogen rich and, and phosphorus rich. Um, once, you get, once you get further down the line, you're looking at fruit and flowers, you want... Um, a feed that's higher in potassium because mm-hmm. that that feeds the fruit and the flowers. And are there any any crops that you would sort of say, oh, steer clear of feeding these? They don't need it, or yeah, anything like yeah, that? definitely uh, things like herbs generally because they're Mediterranean plants. They live in a poor uh, soil environment, mm-hmm. so you wouldn't need to feed them at, at all, really. Um, some of the flowers as well, things like geraniums, um, marigolds. Again, the Mediterranean plants they don't need a lot of feed. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas something like a clematis or a dahlia they like lots of feed and and rich soil Mm. and obviously vegetables as well some of those are greedier than others (laughs) yeah yeah definitely (laughs) 
Um, and then our final question for you today has come in from Simon on Twitter, who has said, why does the material I put in my Dalek compost bin never turn into compost? Do you think it would need more heat, more turning, additives, anything like that? Um, it, it could depend on the location of the bin itself. If it's stood on concrete, then really you need to attract worms to it because we need to get worms into the, the compost to break it down. Um, so a trick would be, if it is on concrete, before you place the bin, lay some newspaper down or cardboard and wet it and then place your bin on top and that'll attract worms underneath to get the worm culture into your, into your bin. Mm. Also, there's... There's compost accelerators that you can uh, use. Envy, Envy have their own. That's a, a compost accelerator. And again, it's it's really easy to use. It's just in a tablet form. You add it to a watering can of lukewarm water and and, and water that onto your to your bin. You can you can do that at any time. Um, the other thing as well is it's getting the balance of what you put in there right. You need sort of fifty fifty mix of uh, carbon and, and nitrogen rich. Um, products in there so th things like um cardboard twiggy material that's your carbon-based uh, product yeah whereas grass cuttings trimmings from your vegetables in your in your kitchen mm -hmm. all that's going to be rich in um uh potassium mm -hmm. and uh, phosphorus that'll help that will help break down your compost heap you, you just need to keep it at the, at the right mixture not too wet not too dry um and it, it should really look after itself. But the other thing is not to be in any hurry. It can take up to two years for certain things to break down in a compost yeah. heap. Everybody seems to be obsessed with speed. But the more time you take mm -hmm. um, and more care you take, the better the end result will be. And once you've got to that stage, um, you, you'll have a constant supply of compost because all the time you're adding yeah. to it. Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, I think sometimes the temptation, as with a lot of things in the garden, is um, you start something off and then straight away you're sort of looking at it thinking, oh, when am I going <laughs> to exactly. get this? When am I going to be yeah. able... I mean, yeah. I have to admit, I'm awful for that with when I've sowed my seeds. As soon as as soon as they've been sowed, I'm like, right, where are they? <laughs> yeah, it definitely exactly. teaches you What's to be more happening? patient, doesn't it, as a, as a gardener? Yeah, it's about being yeah. patient, but it's also about taking time to enjoy what you're doing. You know? yeah, definitely. Don't... don't don't always just dash about all the time. Take time to sit and look at what you've done and, and reap the rewards of what you've done as well. Yeah. I think that would probably be, uh, if I can make a small suggestion for a product for Envy's future, might be if you could create patience for gardeners. <laughs> I would really appreciate some of that. So. Yeah. <laughs> Sell by the bucket load. <laughs> yeah, get that, get that in a bottle or a tablet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for answering those questions. Yeah, and I know you, you mentioned um, a couple of the MV products in there. Would you be able to tell the listeners um, where they can get those from? Yeah, there's a, a, a website. Um, it's all online. Um, so just if you just put in MV into your search engine and you should get to the site easy enough. Yeah, and that's E-N-V-I-I, -I, isn't it? It is, yeah, double I on the end. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us and we'll let you get back to your garden now. And Blake, shall we go and grab George and yep. have a team chat? I don't know whether you both saw this, but I was reading um, about how Calvin Harris, I think we, we've mentioned to each other before about how he likes gardening, but he's been speaking about it um, again and how it essentially enabled him to keep making music recently which I thought was mm. a cool little perk of uh, having a veg plot mm. so he yeah. I think he was maybe sort of um, struggling a bit with uh, what he was creating mm. um, and found that he went away uh, grew some veg and then has come back kind of feeling a bit refreshed and ready to start making some some new tunes again so oh, uh, the inspiring great outdoors exactly so what he actually said to kiss breakfast was um that maybe he needed to do a little bit of gardening and maybe the songs he was making weren't the right songs to put out uh, at that time so he did a bit of gardening. He grew a few carrots, grew a few celeries, and eventually <laughs> has come back to a place where he wanted to make something again. So um, I thought that was just quite a positive little yeah, story. That's so lovely. And I think on some level, we can all relate to it as well. I think um, especially as we're still 
um, working from home at the moment, you know, if you ever reach a bit of the working day where you think, oh, I, you know, I, my brain feels really stuck now. Yeah. Just going out there and having a little look at little look at your plants can really refresh mm. you. Oh, it's such a good screen break. I think sometimes because you sit at your screen and you're just in front of the screen for hours, being able to just pop out for five minutes and I just go and check in and check that everything's okay and um, make sure that nothing's been eaten by slugs <laughs> overnight, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. that's I a very sort of subject the, um, at the moment. Yeah, I oh, know. I wonder if the the new music will be about his veg plot. I would love that. <laughs> we'll have to I listen really out for so. any sort of <laughs> subtext, you know. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> so almost on the same theme, BBC Radio Two's uh, Zoe Ball um, was speaking in the Independent about um, the Big B Challenge, which Radio Ooh, Two yeah, I heard about yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of reminding us all about the importance of encouraging pollinators. So uh, they're asking um, young young gardeners to design a bee-friendly garden and uh, the winner will be made by the RHS. Um, at, I think it was going to be at a children's hospital as well. Um, oh. uh, so, yeah, that's an amazing competition. That's such a lovely story. Isn't it? But obviously the wider point is... Um, is that one about pollinators and apparently I was the other notes they'd put in were apparently there's 270 species of bee in the UK well, that's remarkable oh, isn't it yeah but um obviously we know that bees and insects are in decline um because of the the loss of flower rich habitats so we kind of all need to do our our bit to encourage them in the garden if you know and if we're going to be uh, offering out a quick tips to people here obviously it's mixing in some some flowering plants probably into your veg plot is a good way to to mm -hmm. start mm -hmm. and um, maybe leave an area and don't weed don't do any weeding in one little corner and uh, and that can be a habitat can't it and, and mm -hmm. a place for pollinators obviously you get things like dandelions and such which which also attract pollinators do you mm -hmm. two do any what pollinator friendly things do you try and try and do well i haven't been weeding so much just but that's just more <laughs> we're gonna pretend yeah. that that's for, because i was yeah. doing something yeah. good for pollinators for um, but reasons. actually i have noticed that it is attracting more for those reasons so i am now tempted to mm. take longer to tidy up but um i think that's as much a benefit for me as it is for the yeah. local bee population absolutely yeah. it helps everybody <laughs> and i think um i've been trying to incorporate more um flowers in as well because as I've mentioned before as I grow in my garden there's not an enormous amount of space and before I have fallen into the trap of thinking well if I can't eat it mm. I'm not gonna grow it <laughs> um, but I think I've actually really embraced the embraced the flowers this year and yeah it's I mean, I have to say, I can understand why the bees like it. I know they like it for a different reason, but it does look very <laughs> pretty as well. <laughs> Instead of looking like my back garden is just a functional allotment. And mm. um, what do you do in your garden, George? My answer would have been exactly the same as Blake's of accidental not weeding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I've seen a lot of bees this year, mm. but definitely. You mentioned they're adding flowers. I have an unusual flower story for you. I don't know if either of you are watchers of Pointless. Love Pointless. Um, but previous The Dirt guest, Mark Lane, was on Pointless and gave an unusual tip. Um, basically, he was asked for some gardening tips for the lesser or not even at all gardener and he replied if you buy a bunch of flowers everyone always says they die too quickly so put some bleach some vinegar some aspirin and some sugar into the bottom oh that sounds oh. like a really dodgy concoction <laughs> he said yeah. a teaspoon of each will make them last about seven to ten days longer that sounds like the least likely combination of things to do that i know if anybody else had said this i'd be like are you pulling my leg but as it's mark lane i'm well yeah yeah maybe we should give that a go no definitely I mean I think it's a very fair point that if you don't have your own cut flowers that you grow yourself and can bring in as and when if you do buy flowers they often don't last very long do they mm. but yeah 
just thought I'd drop that one in ah. for you. And um, on the subject of tips, because you know how I love to link things to other things, Blake, I believe you have some tips for us. <laughs> I do. Lots of crops will be moving outside at the moment. Give veg that's ready for life outdoors a flying start by watering it in your chosen spot well an hour or so beforehand so that moisture reserves of both the plant and the site are topped up. Tease out any congested roots and make sure your crop is neither too deep nor too shallow in its hole. Firm it in place gently and to make watering simpler, create a small circular dip around the outside to act as a moat when water is added or sink an upturned bottle next to each plant. In the fruit garden, move citrus trees outside now. Gradually acclimatise them to the higher light levels by opting for a shady spot for the first couple of weeks. Peg down strawberry runners if you'd like to propagate from your stock, choosing healthy plants only and then lifting them in the autumn. Finally, take some time soon to thin out the new shoots of raspberries to ease congestion and keep rows within bounds. Begin picking early varieties now too. The herb gardener can plant out basil, which was sown in spring under cover, harvesting it regularly. Oregano can also be harvested now. Pick these and any other leafy herbs in the morning to ensure they stay fresher for longer. Also consider leaving a few foliage herbs to flower. Oregano is adored by hoverflies and butterflies love mint blooms. Have a lovely week on the plot and until next time, happy growing. Thank you for listening to The Dirt in association with Envy. You can find an amazing range of high quality organic feeds, fertilisers and pest control products at envy.co.uk. And don't forget to subscribe for free to make sure you never miss an episode of The Dirt. We'd love it if you rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to tell all your lovely garden and allotment neighbours where to find us. Plus, as a special treat... We've got an exclusive Grow Your Own magazine offer just for the dirt listeners. Head to growfruitandveg.co.uk forward slash gpod7, that's G-P-O-D and the number 7, or call 0800 904 7000 and quote gpod7 to receive seven issues of our magazine Grow Your Own straight to your door for just $29.99. That's eleven ninety four off. Every issue is edited by me and the team and is packed with gardening advice and jobs to tick off your list and a big bonus. Each magazine comes with a selection of free seeds so you can get growing straight away. Check the episode notes for details and terms. And on a final exciting note, we're on the hunt for podcast guests and the next one could be you or someone you know. If you, a friend or a family member, has some great gardening advice, dirty gardening secrets or funny plot disasters they'd like to share, let us know by emailing thedirt at growfruitandveg.co.uk.